Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. On this episode, Tara McGee from Hemmings joins us, and we are talking about our new series, I Rock Rehab, on the Hemmings YouTube channel, where Terry was our crew chief. Terry, how you doing, bud? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So it's interesting. So on our IROC Rehab series, uh, I'll give you guys the quick gist. Right now, it's up on YouTube. We recently aired our third episode of the series. And what we did was we took a 1987 Chevrolet Camaro IROC Z, black car, T-top, leather interior, with a very interesting rod knock going on in that TPI motor. And then we ripped it apart and kind of revamped it, rehabbed it, so to speak. Um, what we noticed is that we're getting a ton of comments on certain aspects of the build, and we wanted to address some of those comments uh, to anybody who's listening, to people who have watched the series or are planning to watch the series. Uh, so, Terry, why don't you give people just an overview of, of the car itself, why we didn't go full restoration, and why we chose kind of the path that we chose? Yeah, I think we started even looking for third gen because we wanted to find a car that we thought was still a muscle car, but attainable, right? So that pointed us to the 80s and 90s. And we kind of honed in on the third gen because we, a lot of us like Fox Mustangs, for example, I have one, but they're becoming less and less cheap all the time. Um, so third gens are still pretty accessible. Lots of parts in the aftermarket. It's a good old Chevy Camaro. So in a sense, you can't go wrong. And so that's kind of how we arrived at, at the model. And we kind of, I think we all felt like, well, it's a third gen. We want to do a Camaro. If you're going to get a third gen Camaro, it's kind of got to be an IROC. Right. And if you're going to get an IROC, uh, well, it probably should be the 350 car. And we didn't know if we could find one. And we found this car uh, and got kind of lucky with it because I think we did well buying it as it turned out. Mm -hmm. um, the restoration thing, I don't think we were ever thinking about no restoring the car we wanted to make it a car to enjoy right that was part of the deal too was let's not work on something that's going to be so precious that when it's done nobody's going to want to drive it or park it anywhere we want a, a car that we can get out and use and i think you were the one who suggested let's make it a car that you could take to track days sometimes if you wanted to because third gens were good handling cars and third gen would make a pretty good weekend track day car mm -hmm. so pure restoration was really never part of the deal I think generally all of us sort of agree we don't really like cutting stuff up so that it can never be put back the way it was. And I don't think we cut anything up on this car other than uh, the tiny little holes we had to make to <laughs> make it a, a five-speed manual. But that's, uh, I think, well worth the, a, a couple little scars. So that's kind of how we arrived at, at that part of it. Yeah, and, and I agree. I think that, uh, you know, when you do a full restoration on a car, you're talking... I mean, everybody knows you're talking big money, right? A paint job alone will cost you 20000 plus. And by starting with a car that needed work that was tired, we were able to bring a bunch of, of manufacturers in and aftermarket people to kind of help us along and ask them what they wanted to also see the car become, right? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, IROX right now are, are really starting to bring some decent money, but you could still buy one like we did. And Terry, what do we pay? Eight grand for this thing? Six grand, seven. something like that? Seven grand. Seven grand for it. So, and what we, what we bought was a super solid car, not a hint of rust on it, a car that was basically garaged its entire life. At least we think it was right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to say we were surprised. I was one of the people who went and looked at this car when we were trying to find mm -hmm. one to buy. And we bought that car out of Schenectady, New York. And if you look <laughs> at a map, I mean, that's rust belt territory. You would, right. you would not go to Schenectady to find a rust free car. We were looking locally because when we went to buy it, we thought we were in a hurry. As it turned out, we weren't in a hurry, but right. um, we landed on the car. It was the right car. It seemed to be in good shape. Um, I did not have the opportunity to put it up on a lift when I was checking it out, so I just kind of rolled around on the ground as best yeah. I could. I mean, you can't get under a third gen <laughs> yeah, good luck. on the ground. It looked solid. It looked like the fasteners were not rusty or particularly rusty. When I was doing that, it looked pretty greasy and oily underneath, which I kind of liked because, mm -hmm. you know, old Chevys used to, I used to say they used to come with a self, self -loop. proofing option, you know, <laughs> leak fluids for its entire life. So yep. that does once we got in the shop, um, I think we knew we had a decent car. We didn't know that it wasn't going to fight us almost at all. I mean, even the right. control arm bolts and stuff that usually you wind up having to cut a few out. 
everything just came apart. The exhaust system unbolted. Yeah. Uh, so we checked the car out. We thought we had a decent car. It turned out to be better than we even thought it would yeah. be. Yeah. And, it, and it's interesting because, um, you know, as a, as an East coaster, um, you know, rust is obviously one of the major things you look at. And I'll say this right out of the gate. If you are ever going to buy a car to restore to, to rehab, so to speak, to just make it to a better driver, you want to, you want to buy the best car that you can. Uh, and that does mean if you have the opportunity to crawl underneath it, to see if there's any rust, to inspect, um, contact points for, um, corrosion and things like that because we were very fortunate that when we did actually get this up on the lift terry's right the chevrolet self-lubrication factor came <laughs> into play <laughs> and all the nuts all the bolts everything really came off easily which made our time working on the car really more enjoyable because we didn't yeah. have to fight and that's that's a big thing um you know when you look at the car you could see flat out that this is a well-used driver right this is a yeah, you know, a 35 year old car with faded paint, um, but whereby it's still in good shape. Now, you know, you talk about some things that we addressed. We put a new motor in it. We put a new transmission in it. We redid the suspension uh, brakes. We just upgraded to to better factory quality stuff. Um, and then interior, we kind of upgraded stuff like that as well. So, again, not a full restoration by any means, but turning a nice driver candidate into a much better driving vehicle mm -hmm. than it was when we purchased it um i think one of the things we wanted to address was why did we use some of the parts that we use why did we take it in a direction where you know on the youtube videos and if you go to youtube and you go to hemmings motor news uh, our channel you can watch the videos um some of the questions that were asked to us and we want to we want to address some of those for the viewers um let's start out with the big one right so first and foremost, this thing had, what was it, the L98 TPI? Yep. Yeah. So it was a 350 from the factory. Uh, 87 is the first year that the 350 came back. Some people are going to say, no, it was 86. So they allegedly built a handful of 350 cars in 86. But I think for regular production, it was 87. Mm -hmm. um, it's coded as the L98, which is the Corvette code. But the motor in the F body had two bolt mains. I think Corvettes were four bolt main and the Corvette had aluminum heads, whereas the F body had iron heads. And then it was a different horsepower rating. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, this thing was a 350 uh, all along. So um, that was kind of a big deal. I know it sounds silly to, now it seems silly getting excited about a 235 horsepower <laughs> right. engine, but it was a big deal at the time. Well, that motor um, also made good torque. What did it make? 320 pound feet of torque or so. Yeah, I think the, I mean, torque really was a strong point of the tune board setup. That's really what yep. it was arranged to do. And they, when I drove this car, it makes you think it's faster than it is. You right. Know, you, you poke it, it really jumps, even though, yeah, they weren't super fast cars, certainly <laughs> not by modern standards. But, right. But fun to drive, you know, and, and I think GM spent a lot of time trying to make it feel that way and they, they succeeded. Yeah. Well, when we when we got this car, um, we had bought it. There wasn't a rod knock. And then unfortunately, we drove it a little bit and it developed a very wicked rod knock. Yeah. And for some people watching the video, we've gotten some questions are that were, hey, did you guys induce that? Did that really happen? And the, the short answer is it 100 percent happened. Yeah. Um, it was the rod knock that you hear in the video is the actual way that that thing sounds. And, you know, if you watch the first video. I will tell you flat out, we tried to blow it up and it didn't pop. It's just, we did burnouts and burnouts and donuts with it. And God bless it. It just wouldn't go, you know? Yeah. I mean, that day, I mean, I, I can vouch to the rod knock it was not really something we wanted to happen in the beginning. We intended originally, I think, to play with the motor that was in the mm -hmm. car. Um, and I can tell you too, like, we didn't even really have a chance to beat on the thing before no. it started knocking. It's weird. I mean, you've know, been playing with cars for a long time, and usually you get some kind of warning. It had a tick that sounded like a valve train noise that yeah. kind of came and went, and then very suddenly it turned into a knock. And it was even then it sounded like valve train noise. But right. the more I looked, the more I found, nope, it's coming from the bottom. So change of plans, no playing around with the tune port motor. Um, on the day that we shot all the road stuff and the burnouts and the donuts mm -hmm. that was the day before we started wrenching on the car 
Yeah. And I know you fully intended to blow the thing up that Oh, day. I was ready to send it to Valhalla, man. <laughs> and I was kind of like, and then I was sort of thinking, you know, if it blows up, it may lock up and that might make it a little harder to get apart. Although in retrospect, the motor and trans are still joined together in the garage. That's right. Um, but it never did let go. It got louder. Yeah. But never blew up. And I think we got to a point where we're just like, all right, we've gotten done everything we want to. Maybe the car has earned a reprieve and right we also kind of wanted to or at least i did i figured well that that 350 is a good core we can do something yeah. with that later um it, it's done everything we needed to do well it did it did everything we needed to do for plan b it didn't do everything we wanted right. for the original plan um and i've had some friends of mine say you guys you, that noise is canned you put that in i'm like no nope. that's and i even asked you did you guys play around with this absolutely not <laughs> that's real but um yeah it it was real um it's kind of amazing that the burnouts and the donuts didn't finish it off but right hey it's, it's still sitting out in the shop i haven't taken it apart yet i'm kind of curious but uh i just haven't had time to get to it yet but we will take it apart and see what happened and i think we will rebuild it for a separate project but so i think so too one. Well, I think that um, that that addresses also um, why didn't we rebuild it? And you you had brought up a great point also. You know, again, this is a 35 year old engine with 35 year old parts on it, and you know, try, we actually went with a with a great crate motor from Edelbrock, which was a, a 380 horsepower, 400 and it was 410 pound feet of torque small block, um, and we did that for a very specific reason. But we didn't go back and rebuild the the L98 for the simple fact that and Terry, you addressed this parts aren't that readily available for these things right yeah i mean the small block itself of course there's plenty oh, of you get anything yeah um but the thing that i had originally kind of almost been excited about doing was tinkering with the tune port and trying to get a little more power out of it and when we got the car and i started looking i was a little dismayed to find that a lot of the stuff they used to make for tune port cars the aftermarket used to make mm -hmm. you can't get anymore um a lot of the intake manifolds, the bigger runners, mm -hmm. um, the, the lower manifold, uh, there's other stuff. A lot of the tuning parts, plus the computer that runs it is by modern standards. It's kind of <laughs> slow and it's, yeah. it would be difficult. You know, back in the day, we didn't even think that we could tune those computers because we couldn't. Right. So we just kind of worked around it, but that was never really right. Um, so yeah i mean i the one thing i found that you can still get if you're playing with a tune port that i wanted to do was scoggin dicky uh performance center which is a chevy dealer that sells a lot of gm performance parts they have their own lower manifold for the tpi that will allow you to use vortex heads um which i kind of wanted to do but the other thing is that manifold does not like rpm i mean the stock tune port is done at around 4800 i think and those narrow, very long runners, they were designed to create that ram tuning effect to make torque mm -hmm. at a particular RPM and had to work with the cam to do that. Uh, once you start messing around, that manifold kind of quickly becomes a choking point. The aftermarket manifolds were larger, used to be able to get larger runners. I don't know if you remember, but back in the 80s, when Lingenfelter started playing with those, they just, yeah. I think it was them and SLP too. They just cut the pairs of runners and welded <laughs> plates to Siamese them to to change sort of the nature of how the runners would would flow to, so they could move more yeah. and make more power upstairs. Um, but that turned out to be, you know, a, an experiment that was going to be a lot harder to do than we thought. So right. when the motor was bad, I had even thought about, well, maybe we can use a modern uh, fuel injection control system to sure. run TPI, which would still be interesting to do. And maybe we will do that when we put that motor together. But for the purposes of the IROC, it seemed like that was going to be a lot more difficult than we had originally anticipated. So when Edelbrock said, well, our crate engine comes with fuel injection, it was kind of like, well, mm -hmm. okay, that's going to be yeah uh, here. Well, not, not only would it, was it easier, but as, as opposed to going with an LS, and a lot of people have said, well, why didn't you go with an LS? You know, there, there's something about looking under the hood of the small or, or uh, an IROC and seeing a traditional small block. And I actually really like that. And the other thing that we had all talked about was this is not a, a massive, like, oh, we're not building some 700 horsepower, like, rocket here. 
this the idea was to make it a better driver and a better performer in the 21st century right so to be able to go out to cruise at 80 miles an hour on the interstates and to really be enjoyed and play with on the racetrack a little bit if you wanted to but not build something that was overkill and you know with that said the edelbrock small block had two great amazing advantages one as a traditional small block everything the entire front drive accessory system bolted right up to this thing Right. So we could use yeah. the pulleys, the alternator, the power steering, the AC, everything literally just transferred from one right to the other. And that that's a big deal when you're doing something like this. Yeah. And when we started this, too, I mean, a lot of this doesn't factor into the video series. And I think you would probably agree. We didn't want to turn this into a we're going to lose the shop kind of thing because nobody needs any more of that. Right. But we did have some time constraints on the on the project. That's correct. And so we did need to keep it something that we could feasibly do within the confines of the time we had. Um, I think at one point we didn't know we'd be replacing as much as we did. So, for example, the exhaust system. Sure. We wound up changing everything, including the headers, which worked out really well. But I think at one point we didn't know that we would be going that deep. Right. So to your point. Yeah, a traditional small block was a much simpler engine swap than converting to LS. And a third gen with an LS, a lot of people have done that. And it is really cool mm -hmm. uh, because third gens have, you know, again, they're attainable. They handle pretty well. Sure. You can still get a lot of suspension stuff for them. They're relatively light, uh, mm -hmm. certainly compared to modern cars. I mean, I, you know, 3,500 and some of yeah. them, you can make them way less. Um but again, yeah, for this project, um, we kind of wanted to get in and get the car back on the road quickly. And we were able to do that within two weeks. And yeah. sticking with a traditional small block really helped that a lot. Yeah. And I think the other thing that people need to understand is there's a cost, there's a cost factor here too, right? Um, you know, by going traditional small block, you're saving yourself a lot of money. Now, we obviously went with a brand new engine for Metal Brock, right? You don't have to do that. Any traditional small block Chevy, 350 wise, 305 will fit in here, right? And that's a big, oh, yeah. big thing. And so we we film this series as more of a guidebook, not an instructional series. And it's not to say you have to use or do everything that we did to this car, meaning you don't have to put a manual in it. You don't have to do all the suspension, right? But we wanted to build a car that said, well, what if we did this, 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 what would the outcome be? And so, which is why we did what we did. But as viewers, you can go back and you can feel free to say, you know what? I really liked how it came out with this new motor. Um, you know, the Edelbrock system had the Profo Floor sequential EFI on it, which was a, a an amazing, fully tunable system. Like, well, I'm going to take that element and I'm going to put it in my car. Or I really like the idea of the TKX five-speed manual. I'm going to take that element and I'm going to put that in my car, right? Or, you know what? BMR, all the stuff, the the suspension and the exhaust that that we got, let's put that in the car. So take from it what you will, but understand as a package, this is what we felt worked really well. And you can see it from start to finish. Again, not instructional, more of a guidebook though. Yeah, I would agree completely. I mean, and and if you added up every uh, dime that would have had to have been spent to do what we did, yeah, I, it might not be accurate to say it was low buck. Right. But I agree with you completely. Any of the individual things we did could be done with third gen. And at one point, as an example, when the rod knock came up and I was still thinking, well, damn, we wanted to do some stuff before yeah. we swapped the engine. Um, I was actually briefly thinking about getting an engine that a friend of ours had in a rotten truck. It was a 90s 350. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, I can swap some stuff over and get the car running again and do that a regular guy could have done something like that or just gotten a, a basic 350 sure. they could have put the tune port on it um if they had manifolds they could have used the headers and exhaust we did if they wanted to just like you said just do a stick conversion because they've always wanted to have a stick in their car they right. could have just done that um the suspension stuff was all bolt on and in fact you don't even need to do everything we did you could have just no. bought sway bars you could have just bought the control arms, or even you could just put a set of conies on them and leave yeah. everything else stock. So yeah, you can absolutely cherry pick a lot of the stuff that we did here, uh, and or you know, to, and stop there, or keep going, or yeah, do something different. Yeah. Um, well, I know you know going down the list of some of the questions that we got, right? Um, so 
you know, one of, one of the things, and this is this always cracks me up. People said the IROC is not a muscle car. The IROC is a pony car. And I, I think let's let's address that right out of the gate. Um, when the Camaro was introduced in 67, it was a pony car. That is fine. So is the Mustang. That is fine. Over the years, the IROC and the Camaro morphed into muscle cars. When the second gents came out, I don't care what anybody says, that's a muscle car. Right. I don't I don't particularly think it was it was so much a pony car because the power level started going up and it was a much thing. Third gens, muscle cars kind of ceased to exist to an extent, right? In the in the early 80s. So when the Camaro came out, I think it kind of bridged that gap between no longer muscle car or no longer pony car, but now it morphed into a more muscle cars vehicle. Yeah. I you know, the term the what is a muscle car? I've been editing a muscle car magazine for a long time, and this comes up a lot because there is a lot of guys who think a muscle car was built between 1964 mm -hmm. and 1972 right. or maybe 74, and that's it. And then you get the guys who will say, Well, a muscle car has to be an intermediate coupe, uh, a Camaro and a Mustang are pony cars. Um, I would say, uh, well, I'll say a few things. The pony car thing, I agree with you. I mean, that, that was kind of a thing when they came out. And back then, there were a lot of six-cylinder Camaros and Mustangs. There were muscular versions of those mm -hmm. cars that I think qualified as muscle cars. Today, I would say, you know, we've been through so many years and different generations and, and eras of American performance car. Because at Muscle Machines, the magazine we've always kind of been dedicated to the American performance car because we didn't right. want to limit ourselves to just that original bracket. And today, it's interesting. If you look, I think Ford and Chevy both refer to the Mustang and the Camaro as sports cars. And I always Correct. kind of thought that was a little weird too. I think it's only Dodge that really plays the muscle car yeah. firm, which I appreciate. So my view of this is, look, at this point in time, if it's an American car and has a V8 engine and it drives the rear wheels and it was intended to be a performance car, it probably falls under that muscle car uh, yeah. umbrella somehow. And I, in that way, I think the IROC does. Um, we're taking a little license with the term, but, you know, it's 2000, almost 2023. Cars with V8 engines and rear wheel drive are, uh, yeah. there's not many left and there's probably right. going to be fewer very soon. Right. So play along i guess I yeah I, I think that's a great way to yeah, yeah that, i think that's a great thing um you know it's interesting aside from engine drivetrain we also did some interior upgrades and and i think anybody who's ever driven a car from the 80s or even the early 90s in this day and age knows that the plastics of that era were not are not will never be great even in fully garaged units um you know the plastic peaches they got brittle and they dried out even if it was a fully garage kept car and so one of the things we ran into and and if you do a car like this odds are you're going to run into it too everything snapped <laughs> connectors would snap pieces of the interior you would be like oh, okay i'm just going to move it snap crack <laughs> it's it's like everything it's it's you had a god it it think of think of trying to bend a piece of spaghetti and trying to find that breaking point you don't know where you know it's there right yeah and it's not that hard to do and that was every piece of plastic in this car yeah i mean you and i were both around when these cars were new and the plastic interiors were not good then i mean i remember we knew then i mean these, i'd be riding in these cars when somebody would get their hands on one and they creaked even when they were relatively new cars. <laughs> yeah. And uh, especially in the Camaro, they had all those panels that looked like yeah. they were held on with Allen head bolts that are also plastic. And, and which I was reminded of when we we're working on this car, some of them are really screws and some of them some are more plastic. plastic. <laughs> and you don't know which ones until you, you know, right. it. Um, and I didn't remember from back then which ones were or weren't. So, yeah, add 30 something years to a car that was already kind of creaky and brittle and, and nothing good is going to happen. And then add to that bad choices people along the way made. Like yeah. our car had all that fake carbon fiber stuff oh, glued typical to Typical 80s, like awfulness going yeah. on. You know, the glue on dash bezels and shifter bezels and all that stuff that we, 
had to get rid of and thankfully it came off and didn't ruin everything um i was surprised too at how much stuff classic industries has for these and uh i know that sounds like a uh it, that's not a sponsored plug i they, just, they have oh dude everything happy to go through that catalog and see oh cool i can get this i can get this oh good this yeah. is broken or otherwise yep. ruined so i can get this um I don't usually, I have Classic Industries catalogs because I have a couple first gens, but I don't usually pay that much attention to the third gen parts. So yeah, it was nice to see. There are still some things that aren't in there, but um, they're always adding stuff. That's kind of cool too. Every time a new catalog comes well, out, there's new And I, I, think that's, I think that's also a really valid point, right? If, if somebody is going to build a car, restore or rehab a car from the 80s or 90s, right? Um, do your due diligence and see if the parts actually are available. So you know, if you look at the cars that are really coming up, Fox body Mustangs, I rock Camaros, G bodies right now are, are bouncing off the walls. Like they're, they're starting to really come up. People are hitting grand nationals and stuff like that. Um, do some research and see who offers parts, because if you're going to try to do some obscure thing, right. You're like, wow. if I need door panels for a 96 Impala, right. Or something along those lines that might not be available. So go into it with your eyes open because it might change your idea of what you want to rehab or restore if the parts are available or not. Like I know as a, as a, as a, as a Mopar guy, my God, we had, we didn't have parts. The only time parts started coming in for these cars was literally in the last 10 years. Right. Um, yeah. Which was now it's fine because you can get a lot of the stuff, but 10 years ago, you couldn't. Um, you know, it was funny in the Mopar market, not to divert the conversation, but I noticed wow. years ago, that there were a lot of parts, but they were being offered in very small little batches by a yeah. lot of mom and pops. That's right. And you would have to look in some of the magazines to find the advertising. You know, there'd be like this place and like, yeah, we make a turn signal lens for a 67 Belvedere and an emblem for the trunk of a 72 Roadrunner. And that's it. That's all we have. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now all this stuff's been brought together um, in some of the bigger, bigger catalogs. And of course they have continued to add a lot yeah. of stuff. Um, but you know, you're making another valid point. When we do buyer's guides at the magazines, one of the things we try to point out is on various particular cars, there are certain things that aren't available and, and then sometimes are known not to be available. Mm -hmm. And it really can affect your decision-making or your negotiating. If you, know, if you go to look at a particular car and this certain piece or pieces that you know you can't buy are either not there or destroyed well right out of the gate you know i got right. a problem so it's kind of like that we're going through that again with 80s cars now right and g bodies are a good example because yep. those again the interiors didn't hold up great no. in those cars and you couldn't get parts for those for a long time right. we're only just now finally starting to really treat those things the way they treated some of the earlier cars yeah. So it's getting easier, but there's still a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. and the NOS stuff, people are wise to that now. So, you know, I, I felt like back in the eighties, not as many people knew to go find the NOS parts and seize them, but now right. everybody knows. So, yeah. And it's, it's harder and harder to find NOS stuff. And, but here's the thing with an NOS piece, right? If you find an NOS bezel or this, it's still 35 years old. It's still, true too. it's still, you know, it's, it's not going to be as pliable as you think, even though it might have been in a in a in an attic somewhere. Yeah, you know what I mean. Plastics do lose their moisture over time; they become brittle. So just be cognizant of that. Not having NOS stuff is not always the best thing, right? Yeah, I know. With the with the classic muscle cars, my feeling is NOS stuff at this point is really for like the most valuable cars. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I have a '69 Camaro. It's not a Copo or a Z28. Right. It's a regular Camaro. It's my car and I like it, but uh, I didn't want to drive it. So, for example, I, I had an NOS fender. I didn't put it on. I put repro fenders on it. And I'm like, you know what? If I crash it, I'll just go buy more repro well, fenders. Exactly. I don't right. have to worry about it. If that grill gets right. smashed, I'll buy a brand new one. The NOS right. grill that I used to have, mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep that or maybe somebody who's got right. a Copo or something will need that. Right. So that'd be nice if that could now that's starting to happen with some of the newer cars to where, hey, look, I, you know, you find it, let's say an NOS seat cover kit for a Monte Carlo SS. Well, that's mm -hmm. 
that's going to be something really hard to find if you did find it. Right. And then you install it and you're like, oh, geez, I don't, I don't want to sit on this now. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Well, that's true. Whereas it's, if yeah, you put a repop kit on it, then eh, what the hell? Where it out on another kit. That's you know? exactly right. Um, I think another thing with the Camaro, you know, we got a lot of questions are why did you get rid of the automatic? Why did you, uh, why didn't you go with more power as opposed to something that was just shy of 400 and stuff like that? And I think, you know, when Terry and I, we had all sat down and talked about this and, and I, ter Terry, I think you're the one that you brought it up. You're like, we want to build the IROC that Chevrolet never offered before. Right. So it was the 350, you know, the high power 350 with the manual behind it with the right suspension because you could go out and you could get the one le but if you got the one le could you get it in a manual yeah but with the 305 right. right you still wouldn't be able to get it with the manual if you got the 350 um i think this car we were able to combine a lot of the things that i think all of us would have wanted in 87 right we would have wanted t-tops because t-tops are great um we would have wanted more power, which this 350 gives us, we would have wanted the manual so we could row gears. And obviously we would have wanted better handling. And this is not, like you said, like we said, as you watch the video series, you will see that could have we have gone a lot crazier? We could have. And I think a perfect example of this is the brakes, right? Um, you know, as well as I do, IROC brakes from the factory sucked. Yeah, they're completely inadequate, even for the 80s. Um... It's surprising that they would build a car like this. And you remember like the 16 inch wheels with the Eagle VR tires, that was super high tech mm -hmm. in 1985. Um, it had a lot of these cars had four wheel disc brakes. That was pretty cool. But the front brakes, uh, literally the front brakes on that 87 IROC are smaller diameter than the ones on the front of my 69 Camaro from the factory. Ten and a half. Yeah, right. Is that what we like, measure? 10 and a half inch rotors? I think so. Yeah. My 69, I think they're 11. They're the same brakes that Chevelle's and other cars <laughs> could optionally have. And the, I'm pretty sure the front brakes on a third gen are taken from the G body. I think they just parts bend those. Yeah. And the G body brakes were smaller than the earlier car brakes because they were trying to cut weight out of those cars. And mm -hmm. when they first came out just to get better gas mileage out of them. And the only third gen that had better front brakes was the one LE. And then they put mm -hmm. on, I think it was a Caprice, uh, the big Caprice rotor. So like a cop car or station wagon. Police package rotors, right? Yeah. And they the same used on station wagons and then used yeah. on some of the other full size cars and the other divisions. But those all had five on five bolt pattern instead of the four and three quarter yeah. that Camaro has. So they made those, which you can still buy. One LE rotors, a Caprice mm -hmm. rotor with a small bolt pattern. I think it's the same wheel bearing package, so it fit on the spindle. They cut off the ears that mount the stock caliper, made a bracket, and put PBR aluminum dual piston calipers up front. And that yeah. was your front one LE brakes. But one LE stuff, GM didn't want to build a lot of that. They were only building those cars to homologate them for right. whatever showroom stock type, a uh, couple different right. classes they were running cars in. And uh you can replicate well now there's much better stuff that you can get well, you you but... could get new systems out there but i think you know to to answer some questions about that like why didn't you upgrade the brakes and what we ended up doing was we went with basically a factory kit right new rotors that were just cross drilled and slotted new calipers new pads stainless lines right like yeah. a budget brake upgrade it was just a tune-up a brake tune-up yeah basically. that's all it was and and yeah i guess what we're both trying to say that everybody to let everybody know we know those brakes are terrible. We're not going to leave it that way. We are going <laughs> right. to change it. But with everything else we were doing to the car, and the, you could argue this point, if we'd had a, a brake upgrade kit on hand, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal since we had it all apart Sure. anyway. But we had to kind of draw the line somewhere and we figured let's, for right now, let's just make the brakes work. Right. We'll come back and deal with that later. Um but I think but, the yeah. comments are, I think the comments are great, right? Because here's the thing. We we purposely didn't go buck wild for the simple fact that we knew we wanted to keep evolving this car. So when we do the brake upgrade, you know, we could do that. And I, and I would love to hear in the comments, I wouldn't mind seeing that as more of an instructional thing, mm -hmm. right? These are the brakes we got. This is how we, and we can, we can do video on that. That is much more in depth, which I think is, is totally fine. And the nice part is, now that the car is is together and runs great and everything like that, um, we still have some some work to do on it here and there. 
Um, but this is a great, I want to call it, I'm going to say this is a medium rehab. And I'm going to say that not as a restoration, but as a rehab. Again, you know, we buffed the paint and did all this stuff. And you'll see this in upcoming episodes. Um, but we wanted to leave meat on the bone so we could continue to upgrade this car. So, you know, we baselined it in the, in the first episode so you could see how the Camaro was. Yes, it had a rod knock fine, but you get the idea of how it handled. Um, in the final episode of the series, you'll see the uh, full road test and review of this car to see how all of these parts worked in conjunction. And we do go over everything that we did to this car. We go over the difference in power. We go over the difference in suspension. We go over the difference in, in brakes, even with the, the, the mild uh, upgrade on that. Um, so, to, you know, and again, I, I think we wanted to answer a couple of these questions of, you know, like, are you going to throw away the TPI motor? No, we're not. We're going to pull it apart, see what's in there. Cause honestly, right now we have no idea, no clue what's in there. No. Um, I'm guessing we're going to find out that, you know, one of the rod bearings went bad and it probably screwed up the crank and that will just lend to us building a 383 out of it because why mm -hmm. would you buy a new 350 crank right right um yeah i know i don't i don't think anybody was ever inside that motor before right but we'll find out when it comes apart yeah and I, I think the other thing is uh for those listening you know we're always interested in what type of content you want to see right so we built this great car um is it done for the most part right we're still going to tune it and play with it a little more but what what do you want to see us do with it um, because that's, that's one of our biggest things, right? We, we always want to create content that the viewers want to see. So we built, if you haven't watched it, we did the Dodger Durango Hellcat series that we built into a race support vehicle. Um, that's also on our YouTube channel. Please go check that out. And what do you want to see as a viewer? What do you want to see us do with it? What do you want to see us do with a Camaro? Do you want to see us race it? Do you want to see us road trip it? Do you want to see us continue to wrench on it and do more of an instructional side videos um you know on that um your input is massive to us right and i've always been a fan of ask the audience what they want because they're the ones that watch your stuff right uh, for sure so yeah, i think i was gonna say there's a, there's a lot of stuff we could still do to the car oh, but yeah. it'd be great to hear what people want it, it's been nice to see the positive reaction to the project so yeah from here what what's next there's all kinds yeah. of stuff do. yeah definitely um so i think i think that's it like terry and i wanted to go over some of these things um like you said you know a lot of people requested a longer video and that's that's great to hear i think what we'll probably end up doing is next time we do a series like this we'll isolate different things so like we said if we do a brake job and we do an upgrade we'll we'll go into that so i think when we do upgrade the brakes on the camaro we can go in and make that more of an instructional thing um you know, when we do the setup on the EFI and stuff like that, we can, we can do a separate video on just that. But again, as viewers, let us know what you want. This way we can kind of tailor content to, to I don't know, fulfill everything you want. That's what we do. That's what we're trying to do anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Terry, thank you for, for coming back on the show as always. this I think people, this is a fun series. We had a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Um, yeah. And I hope that everybody enjoys it. So please go watch it. I think uh, if you are looking for your Camaro, obviously we have a massive classified section. Go to the Hemmings website, check it out, find your perfect Camaro there, or look on the auction site. They pop up there every now and then. Um, and then, yeah, go to our YouTube channel and watch IROC Rehab and let us know what you think. Um, Terry, thanks again, man. And I think we'll, we'll do this after the, the sixth episode airs because this is a six-part series. Three just aired. We'll do a full recap. Yeah, Once we can address, uh, address some other stuff that people raise and, and just kind of wrap it up because, yeah, there'll be probably a lot of other questions that come up as the rest of the episodes air. Yep. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. Okay, very cool. All right, Terry, I'll be speaking to you soon. And uh, guys, enjoy IROC Rehab and the other content we have, and we'll see you next time on the Hot Rod Barbecue. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button and we'll come to you every week.